Hi, this is Amy Willis with Adam Smith Works. Hi, I'm Dennis Rasmussen. I'm now a professor at Syracuse University. Hi, Dennis. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We recently conducted a virtual reading group on your book, The Infidel and the Professor, and we asked our participants to submit some questions for you. And we have several questions that we hope you'll answer. Sounds great. Thanks. Here we go. Um, the first question comes from read, a reader named Shal, and she wants to know, when writing your book, was there anything about Smith and Hume that you were hoping to find, but that the evidence just wasn't there for? That I was hoping to find. Um, well, I wish there was more evidence of all kinds when it comes to Smith, right? I mean, this is one of the longstanding complaints is that Smith wrote so little and had so many of his papers burned that there's, there's less there than one would hope. Um, I guess I would have hoped that they would have spent more time together. The, the, I traced their friendship and it, I guess in some ways it's helpful for me that they were apart because they wrote letters to one another. But really, if you total up the amount of time they spent together, it's really not that much. It maybe adds up to a couple of years when they were in the same city, despite their, their close friendship for you know two and a half decades or whatever. So um, I guess I would have expected and hoped for, for more time together. I would have loved to have more little anecdotes. We, we have lots of good anecdotes about Hume. Um, he's a very funny guy, and so lots of funny things that he said that people record. Um, Smith, you know, isn't quite as funny. He has a sense of humor, but he's not quite as funny. Um, and the, the Right. There just aren't as many anecdotes about him. So I guess I would have loved more of that kind of thing. Um, but I don't think, I knew their thought pretty well coming into the book. There wasn't anything totally unexpected in terms of, wow, I really thought that Smith would argue X, but he argued Y. I, I, I you know, had read all the books <laughs> before, um, before embarking on the project. So I guess I just would have liked to have more material to work with. Yeah, sure. Do you think Smith might have been funnier than we think? You know, Sam Fleischacker thinks Smith is funny, that, that he's a funny writer, which I, I'm always kind of curious. But I, I, I've, I've joked once that it was because Sam worked on Kant before Smith, and so if your basis of comparison is Immanuel Kant, then Smith is really quite funny. Um, if you're comparing to Hume, less so. Um, there are a few moments where you might chuckle in, in Smith's works, um, but you have to dig pretty deep for it. It's not really right on the surface the way it is for, for Hume. Yeah. Well, uh, related to your answer, uh, our reader Alice has the following question. Um, she wants to know, in regard to the lost letters uh, written by Smith and or Hume, how certain are we that these correspondences were not part of the collection that was burned at either man's request after their death? And particularly, she says, as recent correspondence of Hume's was located as late as the 1990s, how much hope do you have that any additional letters might be found? You know, you do find new letters coming up from Hume, even some new ones from Smith. Now and then people rummage around in old, you know, the Scottish attic or something like this and, <laughs> and things turn up. Um, they can turn up in libraries. Um, I don't know, there, there's some hope. I, I would think that with thinkers of this stature, if they're not only, you know, Smith letters and Hume letters are, are likely to be published as soon as they're seen. If it's from one to the other, right, two famous thinkers, then it's doubly likely. Um, Boy, I would love it if there there was, and I was hoping to to embark on, you know, to find to, to to get some finds in the course of doing research. Um, I particularly looked for there is a copy Hume, so Hume uh, Hume's copy of the Wealth of Nations. Um, Smith sent it to to him, and and um, we are told by a, a old editor of the Wealth of Nations that he there was an inscription on the flyleaf. And boy, I'd love to know what that said. And I, I searched as hard as I could for Hume's copy of the Wealth of Nations. I, I traced it through all the, the you know, iterations where it, to the library where it should be, and they just didn't have it there. Um, so I was hoping to, to come up with some new finds, and I didn't really come up with anything um, that hadn't been published before. Some things I, I draw on hadn't been published since the 18th century, but there wasn't any real kind of manuscript finds that, aha, I've got this, this you know, piece of evidence that no one else has, has managed to come up with. Rats. But man, wouldn't that have been awesome if you found something like that? Yeah, I was trying. I hey, uh, never give up, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, our next question comes from our reader, Benzian, and he wants to know, um, in your book, you write about the relationship between Hume and Smith, as well as their larger circle of friends. To what extent do you see the social side of Hume and Smith as reflecting something larger about the Scottish Enlightenment? Well, I, I think that's, uh, you know, that is a big part of what the Scottish Enlightenment was, and I think what probably produced the Scottish Enlightenment, insofar as you can say that there's something that produced a, 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 you know, a movement of this sort. I think the, 
debating clubs and societies and so forth that proliferated there played a big role in that. And of course, Hume and Smith are members of those. I don't think they're particularly um, talkative members. They didn't dominate these groups, but they, they participated. And yeah, I think the social nature, the, their ability to get together and talk in a way that, you know, you compare it to say the French Enlightenment, which is another era I've spent some time on, right? Voltaire gets in trouble, he goes off to Geneva, you know, they're, 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 they can't gather on a regular basis in quite the same way that the Scottish literati, as they were often known, could. Um, so sure, I'm sure this played a big role in, in, in forging the Scottish Enlightenment. There are lots of other things, I'm sure the union with Britain, um, which produced more, kind of gave them more security and it produced this economic boom, at least after a couple decades. The high rates of literacy, it was the most literate society in the world. Um, there's a thriving publishing industry, the universities, there's a whole host of things, I'm sure, that go into creating something like the Scottish Enlightenment. But you know, the, the social nature, the clubability of these folks, I think, you know, definitely played a role. Yeah. So how do you relate um, the concept of friendship and this sociality that you talk about? So, for example, would you say that the, the literati of the Scottish Enlightenment were greater friends than those of the French Enlightenment? Greater friends? Um, I guess it depends on your definition of friendship. <laughs> In some ways, yes. I mean, I think um, while Hume and Smith weren't together, as I said a second ago, they weren't together all that much over the course of their lives. Hume spent much of his life in Edinburgh, where there were most of the other uh, literati were there, Hugh Blair and so on and so forth. So he had close friends that he was with all the time. Um, Smith, not quite as much. He had, of course, his colleagues at the University of Glasgow when he was there. After the, his tour of the continent, when he, he goes back up to Kirkcaldy to write The Wealth of Nations, he's pretty isolated unless he yeah. takes the, the boat over to Edinburgh to see, to see Hume and his other friends. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know how to answer that question. The, the, were they better friends? I guess it just depends on who you're talking about when, but um, yeah. Sure. Well, let's push the, the question of friendship just a little because our next question is from John and he wants to know the following. He says, based on your research and all the time that you've spent thinking about the friendship between Smith and Hume, who do you think was the better friend to the other? And he says he asks this because throughout the book, he got the impression that Hume was really interested in their friendship and that Smith was maybe less interested in it. And he said it might be due to the relative paucity of letters from Smith. And it's certainly based on, you know, reading sort of just your book. But he'd like to know what you think about that. Yeah, it's an interesting question, especially insofar as Hume was... Um, for much of the time of their friendship, by far the more famous of the two, you would think it would be, uh, you know, Smith trying to, to get Hume to visit him and, and so on more than vice versa. And it really was the reverse in their letters. As the, the reader suggested, it could be just because we had more letters from Hume pleading, Smith, come see me. And <laughs> Smith's letters too said, Hume, come see me. And we just don't have those letters. That's, that's definitely a possibility. Um, insofar as who is the better friend to the other, um, so I have the one chapter in the book where I, I suggest that um, kind of Hume is more at fault with the dialogues controversy, the controversy over whether to pub posthumously mm -hmm. publish his dialogues than Smith was, which is a, you know, um, I think I'm one of the very few scholars to make that, that claim. So um, I've had some people tell me that Smith is the real hero of the book. Um, I don't know that I intended it to be that way, but um, yeah, I mean, they were both good friends. They both had their moments, I guess I'd say. Well, we'll ask you more about that, so don't worry. Okay. Um, but since you mentioned the dialogues, we have a question from Sarah on that. And what she wonders is, why do you think that Smith was so worried about publishing Hume's dialogues on natural religion, but he seems to be so taken by surprise by the negative reaction to his letter to Strahan on Hume's death? It seems like after anticipating the first, he should have maybe expected the second. Yeah, that's right. That's very good, right? So I guess the dialogues um, is such an open attack on religion and on uh, much that Smith tried to keep quiet about throughout his life that, as I suggest in the book, Hume himself thought there would be a clamor coming from, from the dialogues when he had published all kinds of very openly irreligious things, the critique of miracles and so on, um, from the, almost the beginning of his career. So Smith certainly wasn't alone in thinking that would promote, produce this kind of clamor. Um, the letter to Strahan, so I guess I don't think Smith's Smith was, does seem to have been surprised by the, the as he puts it, very violent attack that the letter to Strahan um, elicited. I don't think he should have been that surprised. On the other hand, it isn't openly irreligious, right? So he is definitely um, 
praising Hume to the skies, who's an open skeptic, religious skeptic, um, and kind of almost parading his lack of concern about the afterlife and so on. But he never brings up God or religion or the afterlife or anything explicitly. So the fact that the, the, uh, what Smith was doing was more, let's say, between the lines, you know, it wasn't in the title of the book, Dialogues on Religion, right? Um, that he might have thought it wouldn't be quite as controversial as it ended up being. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, one more question on scholarship. Uh, Shell wants to know, do you think there's a lack of attention that's paid to Hume with, among Smith scholars? And if so, how do you think Smith scholars ought to address Hume going forward? Um, no, I don't think that. So I, I don't think there's any danger. Well, at least among philosophers, certainly, there's no danger of overlooking Hume for Smith. I mean, Hume has been the, the kind of main focus of philosophers for decades, if not centuries, more than, than Smith. Um, political theorists, maybe there's kind of an even match. Yeah, I guess economists would be a place where I think Hume is overlooked, and I, I make this case in the book, that Hume is um, as overlooked as Smith long was as a philosopher. I think Hume has long been overlooked as, a, as an economist, and so many of his essays on political economy had such an effect on, on the wealth of nations. And even his history of England, I think, had a, an effect in that, that regard. Um, so no, I guess I guess the the main focus of the book, the kind of moral religious stuff. I don't think there's any danger of Hume being overlooked there. Great. Yeah, I would agree with you with regard to economists. We're actually taking Hume on in our next virtual reading group, and one of those sessions will be devoted exclusively to some of his uh, political economy essays, so um, that should be fun. Yeah. Um, okay, I have two more questions, and they're really questions for you, um, and they are as follows. So um, several readers ask a version of the following question. Um, Hume speaks fondly of the questions which drive his passion for philosophy. What are the questions that drive your research? And how was it that you knew that political theory was what you wanted to commit your life to? Wow, so those are big questions. So <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take the, the, the latter one first. How did I know okay. that political theory was a thing for me? Um, like so many people, I was drawn by a great professor. So I, I was an undergraduate at Michigan State University's James Madison College, and my undergraduate advisor was a guy named Dick Sinman, who um, kind of First class I took with him, I was a chemical engineering major for my first oh, wow. year. Undergraduate. So I was very, very far from political theory. <laughs> but as soon as I came upon it, I thought, wow, this is really what I want to do. Um, insofar as it just, you know, it tackles all the big questions that I've always been so interested in. You know, what is freedom? What is justice? What is happiness? What's a good society? What's a good life? Right? These are the biggest questions, some ways I think most important questions we can ask ourselves, right? How should we live our lives? Um, so I don't know how anyone would not want to do this thing, right? Be, be able to spend their lives reading these books, you know, the, the, the best that's been thought and said on these big questions and talking to bright young people and other scholars about them. I mean, it's fantastic. I don't, you know, how does anyone not want to be a political theorist? I guess is, <laughs> is my response to that. Um, in terms of the, the first of the questions, the kind of what, which are the questions that most animate me and my thought and my research um, so I spent most of my career working on the Scottish Enlightenment, the French Enlightenment. I'm now working on a book on the American founders. So kind of 18th century Enlightenment stuff. Um, I think what drew me to that period, well, I find some of the thinkers congenial, I guess I should just say, but more than that, this is really the founding of our way of life, the modern liberal capitalist West, what um, springs from the Enlightenment. And insofar as we should we do care and we should care about what are the virtues, what are the shortcomings of this whole modern project, the whole liberal way of life. You know, this is a great resource for, for reflecting on these types of questions. And, you know, the studying these thinkers allows us to look at the, the our, again, the liberal project from a certain distance. It's not, you know, the just contemporary thinking, but our questions, our concerns are still very much there insofar as, again, they're the kind of founders of our way of life. And so that it gives us a sense of the alternatives to and presuppositions of um, our own outlook in a way that I don't, it's hard to find in, in any other source. That's a really lovely answer. We're totally going to steal that question about why doesn't everybody want to do political theory, right? Um, and what a great commentary on the power of teaching, too. Um, I would love to be in your class, that's for sure. All right, last question. It's a doozy. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. A lot of folks in our reading group thought that you might have a secret preference for Hume over Smith. Interesting. True? 
uh, as I say, I, I've, I've had several people tell me that they thought that, that Smith was the hero of the book rather yeah. than, than Hume. I don't know, I tried to be pretty even handed. Hume is easier to like just as a person. Again, he's funnier, more, more, um, more effusive, more, more passionate, and, and so on. It's Smith, again, it is a lot, plays his cards closer to the vest. You have to, to really get into his thought to, to like him. But no, I like them both. I, don't, I guess I don't know that I have a real, um, a, a strong preference for, for either one. I'll also say that the same person who told me that Hume, that, sorry, that Smith was the hero of the book also said that uh, Johnson and Boswell, Samuel Johnson and James Boswell were the villains of the book, um, which, yeah, that, that's maybe more plausible in, in certain respects, yeah. Villains is kind of harsh, right? <laughs> yeah, it is, but they, you know, they didn't treat Hume well at all, and you no. know, Smith, after the letter to Strand, they treated him pretty poorly then too, so, um, or Boswell did at least. Um, so, yeah, the villain might be strong, but the, the, they don't, they don't come off as sympathetically as humans get to. Sure. I would like to think that Smith would be just as much fun in a pub as Hume, but I guess, sadly, we'll never know, right? <laughs> yes, alas. So the, the, he did make friends throughout his whole life. He was, you know, he, he always had friends around him. So that does make me think that in person, you know, maybe he, he would have been more fun than he is always in his, his writings, you know. An 80-page digression about the variation of the price of silver in different ages doesn't inspire, you know, great... Uh, Everybody uh, brings that up, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. Well, Dennis, thank you very much for joining us and answering our questions. We really appreciate it, and I know our readers will love to hear from you. Thank you for having me, and thanks for doing the, the reading group on the book. I, I'm, I'm honored. It's our pleasure.